Then let's continue along that path and talk about what concentrations of antibiotics that might drive resistance. So I think that you already been talking about selection, antibiotic, right? So you have seen something along this line of, of selection. So you understand how selection works in principle, where the, if you have communities and you have some bacteria that are able to withstand antibiotic treatment, you treat with antibiotics, basically kill off the other ones and providing more opportunities for the resistance ones to grow by removing the competition. I mean, it's not that it's promoting the red ones, it's basically removing the competition. That's why it's a selection, right? You need to remove the competition. Then the red ones can grow. But uh, that may not happen at all concentrations of antibiotics. As uh, we learned from Paracelsus, who is the father of toxicology, he taught us in the, I think it was the 15th century or so, that the dose makes the poison. So it's, everything is about the dosage, about the concentration of the antibiotic. Uh, so what we've also learned is that quite low concentrations can select for resistance. Uh, this is a conceptual picture that I'll try to explain a little bit to you. Uh, here, we have growth rate of bacteria, how fast they grow, and this is how much antibiotic there is. And you have a blue and a red line that is thought to represent uh, a strain of bacteria that is sensitive to antibiotics. So when you increase the antibiotic concentration, it doesn't grow very well and eventually doesn't grow at all. And this is what we call the minimal inhibitory concentration of the susceptible strain, when it completely stops growth, right? The red one here, is the resistant counterpart. And as you can see here, it still grows when you're increasing the antibiotic concentration, but eventually it will also drop here. And here it would have the mic of the resistant counterpart. So the mic of the resistant one is higher than susceptible, right? So, and usually you, you want, if you have an infection, you want to expose the bacteria to a concentration above the mic. And so usually you aim for a concentration that is above this concentration here. But if it's resistant, that means that, oh, I can't treat it anymore because it will grow at the highest concentration I can give to a person before the adverse reaction starts happening, right? So this is the classical sort of treatment window where, where one would say that, okay, if I give this type of, this much antibiotics, I will favor the resistant one over the sensitive one. But if you look at the growth curves, you soon realize here that even if we go below here at concentration that still allow the sensitive ones to grow, the resistant one will still win because it grows even better. And you can actually, sometimes you can go far below this minimal inhibitory concentration until they grow equally well. If you go down to zero, usually the sensitive strain wins because there's usually a cost involved in being resistant. Maybe you carry a plasmid or something like that, and that may cost something for the bacteria. So it cannot grow as fast. But as soon as you get a little bit of antibiotics there, which we would call the minimal selective concentration, then above that concentration, the resistant one will win. Well, this means that lower concentrations than what basically stops growth of bacteria can select for them. Uh, we published a paper uh, three years ago, I think, uh, where we predicted how low concentrations actually could select for antibiotic resistance. And these are for 111 antibiotics. And as you can see here from the predictions here, this is a number of different antibiotics that where the minimal selective concentrations is around one microgram per liter. That's sort of a typical concentration, a microgram per liter, but some are probably down here, which is, well, now we're almost down to 
10 nanograms per liter, but it's pretty low here. Uh, but these are, these are predictions. Uh, we have also done, and others have done, experiments and try to figure out how much antibiotics is actually required in the bacterial community to select for resistance. And uh, these fit pretty well with the, with the predictions for, this is one antibiotic called ciprofloxacin. I think you've talked about that during the course. Uh, here we found that five micrograms clearly select for resistance. Other researchers have found somewhat lower levels in other experimental systems than this one. This was in um, basically bacteria that we grew on glass slides underwater. So mix of different types of bacteria. And these were the E. coli in those bacterial films. And here is another experiment with tetracycline. And here we saw that one microgram was selecting for this, this, this gene that provides resistance to antibiotics. So these are pretty low concentrations, not super duper low, but pretty low. Antibiotics can actually not only select for resistance, but promote the actual transfer of resistance to other bacteria. And here's a paper where we showed that 10 micrograms per liter increased the number of transfer events from one bacterium to the other of a, of a resistant plasmid. Personally, I think that the selection is more important because transfer to some degree always happened, basically. You can accelerate it with stress, different types of stress, where antibiotics is one type of stress. But for resistance to evolve and really establish, then you also need a selection pressure that favors the ones that have taken up the resistance plasmid. So that's a bit about concentrations that can drive resistance. I'll talk a little bit about co-selection also. Uh, antibacterial biocides and metals may also promote antibiotic resistance by something that we call co-selection. I'll try to explain what that is. Uh, there are two types of co-selection. Uh, one we call cross-resistance and the other one we call co-resistance. Cross-resistant is when a gene or a protein provides resistance to both antibiotics and maybe a biocide or, or a metal. So it, one gene confers resistance to many things. So there for, could be example be a, a, an efflux pump that can pump out both antibiotics and biocides out of the cell. So if you expose bacteria, bacterial community to uh, a biocide, some bacteria carry this pump, this guy would have an advantage, right? And it happens to be antibiotic resistant at the same time. Another type of co-selection is what we call co-resistance. And then it's actually different genes and different proteins that provide resistance to the antibiotics and here the metal or the biocide. But they happen to be co-located, they sit together, they are inherited together, they sit in the same plasmid, for example. And this guy would then be selected, if you expose this community to this metal, well, this bacteria would grow better than the others in the competition, and it happens to be antibiotic resistance. Do you understand? Good. So we looked at the presence of, of these kinds of, of genes uh, across um, different environments. And we looked at plasmids that have been isolated from different sources, from aquatic environments and soils and plants, etc. And here we have plasmids that contains both biocide and metal resistance genes and antibiotic resistance genes in green. And the blue ones are those that contains antibiotic resistance and the red or brownish ones only biocide and metal resistance and no resistance. And what you see here that I think is interesting is that Blue, antibiotic resistance, and the combination of antibiotic resistance and metal resistance and biocide occurs basically in these two environments. That is humans and domestic animals, not wild animals, domestic animals. And this comparison is quite interesting. What is the big difference between domestic animals and wild animals? Antibiotic treatment, I would say, is a major difference here. And humans also. So, and you see metal and biocide resistance, they seem to be present basically everywhere to different extents. Antibiotic resistance genes, not. They're here. 
but here they occur together. So I think that what drove the evolution towards them coming together was probably antibiotic exposure, not metal exposure or biocide exposure. But now, when they're sitting together, it's enough with metal exposure to actually promote them, or biocide exposure. But it was probably not the cause in the first place. We also did a study that I just mentioned. Uh, we had an hypothesis that anti-fouling paints, you know, boat paints, could actually select for resistance. Uh, and maybe that facilitates spread of resistant bacteria across the globe. So we, we didn't do the experiment in big boats like this. We, we, did, we painted panels like this and hung them in the harbor of, of Gothenburg here and let things grow on them, just like on, on, a, on a boat. So we had controls, unpainted and painted panels. And what we see is that we then culture the bacteria that grow there. We actually see that on the painted panels, many more bacteria are resistant to tetracycline and gentamicin, and of course also to copper and zinc, which is what the, what the paints cont uh, contain. So this was quite interesting, right? They were also more antibiotic resistant. But then we looked for resistance genes, and we didn't really find the classical antibiotic resistance genes. What we found was efflux genes that can pump out both biocides, metals, and antibiotics. Those were favored a lot. And this is the cross-resistance mechanism that I just talked to you about. One single gene gives resistance to many different things. So those bacteria were strongly favored by the boat paint. And back to antibiotics in the environment, and let's ask the questions, where can we expect selection of antibiotic resistance. So I've tried to summarize thousands of studies in this simple slide and divided different environments here into industrially polluted environments from drug manufacturing precisely, animal farming environments polluted by that, sewage treatment plants and, and surface waters, in this case in, in the EU. And sort of try to summarize where, what are the antibiotics concentrations that we find. So here we have milligrams per liter, micrograms, nanograms, and picograms per liter. This is not much at all. Uh, and what we see here is that in water, normal surface waters, we find sometimes nanograms per liters. You usually don't find micrograms per liters in surface water. Inside treatment plants, you can get up to here, around a microgram. Uh, animal farming may be a little bit more, uh, like when you're releasing lots of untreated urine, etc., from a farm. But when you talk about environments polluted by the manufacturing antibiotics, the concentrations are way much higher. And I'll talk about that in a second. So where does Resist, where do we find the selection? Um, we've presented to you a study where we looked at sewage treatment plants in Sweden. Uh, we looked at three different plants in Uppsala and two in Stockholm. And we, what we did is what, well, we did different things, but we sequenced the bacterial communities that come into the treatment plants in the influent, and we sequenced the communities when they came out and studied how common are different resistance genes to antibiotics. And we also measured antibiotic concentrations. And if we look at the antibiotic concentrations in the inlet here in blue, dark blue, treated effluent is light blue, and compare that to the predicted selective concentration that I just talked about that we did for 111 antibiotics. We see that for ciprofloxacin, the incoming concentrations was actually higher than those that we thought would select for resistance. So that would point towards a risk for selection. And also for tetracycline. But for the treated water, they were all lower or even undetectable for, for some. So maybe there was selection for tetracycline and ciprofloxacin. But when we then started to look at resistant genes abundances, we, uh, how, how common different resistance genes are. We actually saw that 
oh, they're usually decreased for, for most antibiotics and, and absolutely not increased for fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin and tetracycline. So that didn't suggest that there is selection for antibiotic resistance in the treatment plants. Then we also did another study here in Gothenburg, and we looked specifically at E. coli. E. coli, common intestinal bacteria, that come into Ryaverket here in Gothenburg, and those E. coli that come out of Ryaverket. So the idea was if there is selection here, those bacteria that come out should be a bit more resistant than those that come in. So we sampled many times, I don't remember, it was eight times, ten times, something like that, uh, over a year and a half, I think, and picked individual bacteria coming in, individual bacteria coming out. We determined that the species, each and one of them, and we tested them against the panel of antibiotics. And the pattern was strikingly clear. They are very much the same bacteria that comes in, that comes out. There are fewer that comes out because we reduce a lot of bacteria in the treatment plant. But it's equally common that they're resistant to ampicillin and all these types of antibiotics when they're coming in and when they're coming out. So there doesn't seem to be any selection of resistance in E. coli in Scandinavia's largest sewage treatment plant. Now you can say that, well, E. coli is not really bacteria that thrive and live in the sewage treatment plants because they probably, most of them just pass by. And maybe there's not time enough to, to select from them. That might be true that there could be other bacteria that stay longer inside the treatment plants where there could be selection. But this data doesn't say that there is selection there. Now, uh, when you go out in the environment, you often find antibiotics and resistant bacteria in the same places. And some may easily interpret that as causality, as, oh, there's antibiotics there, there's resistant bacteria there. The antibiotics are selecting for the resistant bacteria. But I think one should be a bit careful there, because correlations doesn't mean necessarily selection. Uh, there could be just a common cause, a common reason why we find antibiotics and resistant bacteria in the same places. And one such common cause could be poo. And P. Because that's where the antibiotics usually come from. They come from us. And gut bacteria in our feces is quite resistant compared to other bacteria in the environment. So any place where you have basically fecal and urine uh, contamination, you'd probably expect a correlation with that. So we, we investigated available metagenomes, uh, analysis of genes in, in, in communities. And we found that there was, there was a way actually to estimate how much poo there is in, 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 in an environment. Because there was a paper that published that there's a, a phage, a, a virus, a bacterial virus, that is very common in the human gut, but not elsewhere. So it could actually be used as a marker for feces contamination. And that phage we could find if we went out in the environment and look at these published metagenomes. And so we went and, and reanalyzed those data sets. And we found that in these different places there was a pretty good correlation between the crass phage, as it's called, and the antibiotic resistance genes. So the more phage, the more poo, the more antibiotic resistance which we published in Nature Communications uh, earlier this year. There was one exception. These environments here contained basically no poo at all, still very much antibiotic resistance genes. These were samples taken just outside antibiotic manufacturing sites in India, where we find extreme levels of antibiotics. So here, it's not the poo that causes the resistance, it's the antibiotics. But in those other places, it could be the poo itself that explains most of the antibiotic resistance. It doesn't exclude that there is selection for resistance, but it could be poo, basically. So I would argue that it might be selection here in those concentrations. We have lab experiments that suggest that, yeah, this does select for resistance in the lab, but 
the final proof for if this happens in the real li in real life environment is not really there yet, I'd argue. In contrast to these environments where there's no doubt about it.